You're listening to the Podcast Detroit Network. Visit www.podcastdetroit.com for more information. Welcome to Smart Sex, Smart Love. We're talking about sex goes beyond the taboos and talking about love goes beyond the honeymoon. I'm Dr. Joe Court. Thanks for tuning in. Today on the show, I'm honored to be joined by world-renowned expert, New York Times bestselling author, and one of the nation's leading authorities in the field of female sexual health, Dr. Jennifer Berman. Jennifer is here to talk about female urology and sexual health. Dr. Berman believes that sexual health for women is a critical component of good general health. As one of only a few female urologists in the United States, she's considered America's leading expert on women's sexual health issues. Dr. Berman is a sexual health expert, urologist, and female sexual medicine specialist. She is also a former co-host of the television show, The Doctors, and she founded and created the Berman Women Wellness Center in Beverly Hills as a comprehensive, multidisciplinary, state-of-the-art center dedicated solely to women and wellness. Plus, she is a New York Times bestselling co-author with her books, For Women Only, a groundbreaking guide to overcoming sexual dysfunction and reclaiming your sex life, and Secrets of the Sexually Satisfied Woman, 10 Keys to Unlocking Ultimate Sexual Pleasure. I'm sorry, 10 Keys to Unlocking Ultimate Pleasure. Today, Dr. Berman is featured regularly on the Dr. Phil Show, the Today Show, and Good Morning America. And she says, sexual health issues are often sensitive topics for people to discuss, and most people don't realize that there's a world of help available to them. Let's talk about that. Welcome, Dr. Berman. Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to do this because um, I do a lot of my own work on male sexual health and, um, you know, not enough. We have a center, so we have 13 therapists and several of them do female sexual health, but I really wanted it to be part of my podcast. So thank you. Okay. You're welcome. You're welcome. Happy, Happy to, be, to here. be here. Would you be willing to share what, how is female sexual health, the problems that women have different to treating men? Well, that's, um, it's a good question. I think, well, from the standpoint of, ma- I am a urologist, so I was trained in male sexual health, and it's interesting because um, when I was in my, my residency in urology, Viagra was just getting approved in, in 1998, and there was this, and I was at the University of Maryland, and we were one of the main testing sites for Viagra, and Bob Dole was just coming out with his ED, and there was a lot of interest and a lot of um, media uh, awareness about it, and women were, a lot of discussions, and, you know, women were talking about it, and I was the only woman in the department at that time. Very few women were going I, going into urology at that time. It's since changed, but um, so I I was in kind of the the trenches and in the forefront before at a time when the medical community really wasn't recognizing or understanding what female sexual health really was. It was more about, um, you know, could you, like, could you have sex? Like, could a penis go in there? And could you conceive? And issues surrounding satisfaction, arousal, orgasm, libido, those weren't things, certainly not things that doctors talked about at all. And, you know, they, in the, in terms of the anatomy and physiology and, you know, what we learned about in medical school, those weren't things that were even, you know, mentioned. That has changed since that time, but, you know, that was a big part of, of my my research and, and, and pioneering. So, um, so from that standpoint, um, that, that really wasn't anything that, that we understood. Now, quite the contrary for men. At that time, we really did have a, a pretty broad understanding of the anatomy and physiology of the male sexual response, the erectile response, the, you know, on a cellular level, a basic science to a clinical, you know, and a, and a clinical understanding. And when we were first, uh, you know, looking at it in women, 
myself included, we sort of applied what we knew in men and kind of said, okay, well, let's do that in women. And women are much more complicated and multifaceted and we couldn't just take the male model and like say, okay, I would take them and I'll put it over here. Mm-hmm. And, um, so, you know, so it's, 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 it's been, been a journey, but you know, the good news is in my lifetime there, which I'm really excited about, there are now two FDA approved medications for low sexual desire in women that are um, FDA approved, which is huge, um, and more coming. And, um, you know, so that's really, you know, kind of a breakthrough. And um, there are, you know, in terms of sexual issues that women have, there's problems with sexual arousal, so lubrication, sensation, um and engorgement. There's problems with libido, sexual interest, motivation to be sexual. Women have problems with pain that can be due to dryness and arousal, but other issues. Um, Problems with orgasm, difficulty achieving orgasm or inability to achieve orgasm. Uh, What else? Arousal, lubrication, orgasm, and pain. Yeah, so those are the main thing. And men are kind of simpler. They have, you know, Inability to attain erection, inability to maintain an erection, and um, premature ejaculation, that, that's one, or delayed ejaculation. And, uh, you know, they're, they're a little bit more straightforward. You know what I never knew when I was a student in my sexology PhD program? I had no idea, um, and I should have known this, but I, I don't know, I, I guess I wouldn't because I'm a gay man and just a man, that, that women have performance anxiety too. I had no idea that women yeah. would have. Can you talk about what that is? Um, well, the performance anxiety that men have is much more, like, obvious because <laughs> it's like something, you know, that, that, it's, that there's something that both parties can witness, um, which makes it more, um, you know, I think um, from the performance standpoint, we're both watching and you've got something that I'm going to notice, which is where the performance part comes in because you've got to do something and I can see that it's not working. Mm -hmm. From the standpoint of women, um, it's not necessarily that they, the perform isn't, I, is it, I hate, I don't really like that word, but they do have um, anxiety about orgasm, I will say, that it, they get they get into their heads a lot, and I you know it's interesting that you brought that up because I you know it's so funny because I wouldn't have drawn those dots I wouldn't have made performance anxiety in men and linked it had you not just said that and linked that to what goes on in women with orgasm mm. and and called that performance anxiety at all until right this second because that so the, the what happens in women and it's something that goes on in their frontal cortex, it's the chatter that goes on in their head, hyperactivity of, um, you know, what about this and what about this, that makes them very effective multitaskers and, um, you know, highly competent, um, you know, mothers, workers, leaders, innovators, type A kind of... Um, uh, people that that are extremely competent individuals in many areas of their lives, but it's hard to shut that off to, you know, okay, now I'm supposed to have sex. Men, on the other hand, can be much more goal-oriented, task-oriented than women. That's not to say all men are, as you just mentioned, the, the performance anxiety, but men are better at it than women. Um, and so m- women do struggle with that. And it's funny because there are certain women that, that struggle more. And there's a drug called Addy, one of the FDA approved drugs, um, are, is designed specifically for that purpose. And, um, I, they, I do believe that they've looked at it in men, 
but it's not, I'm not sure what the data shows, but that's an interesting, I'm going to have to ask, there's a woman named Cindy Whitehead, who's, who's kind of um, the, the founder of that company, who's the one that brought it through the FDA. I'm going to have to ask her about that for performance anxiety in men, whether there's any, um, whether it has a benefit for that, because it does work through the serotonin system, the serotonin pathway, mm. but... Um, but that's a good question. I like that. Um, it sounds like similar to men where, cause that's what happens for men when they get erectile disorder problems. It's they've lost erotic focus. And that's what you're saying happens to females. Mm -hmm. They've lost erotic focus and that's yes. different, right? Than low sexual desire. That's but what happens to women is that they can't orgasm. And then what happens to men is they can't get hard. Right. Uh, or, and then in men with delayed ejaculation, um, what would you say, like, in my, as far as I'm concerned, when, with delayed ejaculation, in my experience, that happens, you know, obviously if men are, you know, with drinking or drugs or things like that, but in men that have had sur prostate surgery and other things and older men, that, that's not uncommon. What, in your experience, do you, would you say is associated with that? Yes, and sometimes there's been some surgeries done to the, yeah. uh, and I forget the term, when the penile opening, penile opening isn't at the center, so there, sometimes that will cause delayed. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's about letting go. Sometimes it's psychological. They're holding back mm -hmm. because with intimacy, it's such an intimate thing, or they have judgment mm -hmm. in their head from how they were raised, whatever. Sometimes it's, mm -hmm. it's not just medical or physical. So would you say also that in men that I you, thank you for reminding me of that too, in men that watch um, a lot of erotic, you know, porn and things that they have difficulty um in it, you know, in a real time situation, because they're accustomed to such high levels of visual stimulation that when they're in an actual, you know, male female or male male situation, the level of um, erotic or visual stimulation doesn't meet, you know, what they're accustomed to. That that can play a role. That's a good point. Um, I, what I here's what I notice about the men with erotic imagery and like in porn is that they get used to themselves. So we, we say we talk about it in terms of porn, but it's not so much what they're looking at. It's that they're used to their own hand. They're used to their own timing. You know, porn never says no. It never has a headache. It never judges you. you know what I mean? And so then when he turns to her, all that comes with another person and he's not used to that. That's what I end up seeing. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay. Yeah. And but um, and so now um, when. When couples come in, the biggest thing I see is the desire discrepancy. And usually it's not always, but usually it's the women that have the lower desire and they feel so ashamed. So it's great to hear about these new FDA drug drugs because I, I've been hearing people say that they don't they're not effective. Is that true or is that not true? Um, the the two drugs well, the problem is it's not that they're not effective. It's the you have to wait. There's it takes approximately eight weeks on one of them for one of them to determine who it's going to be effective for. So they they are that's the issue is that it's not effective for everyone. Like I said in the beginning, it's certain women. So they haven't yet identified responders versus non-responders. So you have to take it for a period of eight weeks before you know whether you're going to be a responder or not. Or not. That's the, that's the issue. And they're right. They're doing some genetic testing right now to, to try and figure out who's going to respond versus not respond. Oh, good. Um, so that, that will help, but, um, that's the issue with the Addy. The other one, the Vilesi, um, that, that works through, through a dopamine pathway and that most women respond to that. But the problem with it is that, that there's side effects associated with it. Now, again, these are the very two first FDA approved, you know, medications. So there's going to be, um, you know, improvements and tweaks to them. The first diabetes drugs that came to the market, you know, were, were a little bit, you know, if we go back and look at those, we, you know, we, our eyeballs would pop out now too. So, so, but I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying. It's not that they don't work. Good. They're not, 
perfect yet. And um, and the other issue with here's the thing with libido. It's like asking, you know, it, do you believe in God? Like li- it's a feeling. So yeah. your libido is different <laughs> for you than what it is for me. And we're trying to quantify a feeling, not blood pressure, not heart rate, not you know the 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 pH of a cell. It, it's an emotional feeling, and they're trying to measure that and you know and quantify with statistical significance and p values it it's it's challenging and so in in a scientific you know laboratory setting so i think that um you know that 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 makes that makes it you know it's hard to do but um but we're doing the best we can and every woman is different and, and the subset of women that they're looking at you know the with with the frontal cortex activity, I suggested to Cindy Whitehead that maybe not start with that subgroup, but it just so happens that the drug, because it works as a serotonin pathway, I don't know why they picked, you know, that that subset to look at. Um, maybe, uh, maybe perhaps because the way, you know, the the initial design, um, when I looked at the very first paper, that was the very, very, very first one, mm-hmm. whoever designed the, the screening protocol was some sort of, um, probably in the same realm, you know, field that you are. He was like a neuropsych guy that did these very complicated um, screening instruments that looked how, how the women were answering these. He was able to assess like personality based on how she was answer, how they were answering tests. So that they were, you know, whether you know, type A controlling. You know, it was per, based on how he how so you could kind of profile people. Um, based on how she, how they were answering these tests. So based on that study, now when people, when women are coming into my office with orgasmic disorder, I've started to like, you know, it's almost like, I hate to say the word, but racial profiling, like, oh, she's one of them. She's going to be, I bet, you know, she's controlling, she's type A, she likes things a certain way, she does this, and she did based on the way that that guy set up his instrument. And and they all are like that. They all, like, there's a spectrum of character traits that we all have, and they fall into this category. It's really interesting. Mm. So, um, and women with orgasmic disorder, and they're either they have difficulty achieving orgasm or inability to achieve orgasm. And by the way, it's libido too. The, these women in the Addy study, mm-hmm. they had lifelong low libido. So they w- they say that they never really were had high levels of motivation to be sexual. They were always sort of like, yeah, whatever, you know, mm-hmm. not asexual. Not like flat, but sort of whatever. That makes sense. Could we um, change a little bit and talk about yeah. pelvic floor because and pelvic pain? Because this is um, talked about a lot now and it's mm-hmm. being done more. And I think a lot of women don't understand. And I think some of my clients feel afraid. Like, what do I have to do? I'm going to a physical therapist and what are they doing to me? Could you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, well, pelvic floor disorders are, um, you know, a big a big issue um, across for men and women, actually across you know all ages. The um, and it can be I, pelvic floor disorders can be either things are too loose, like as you get older and have babies, or things are too you know too tense and too tight. So whether it be pain due to tension and tension myalgia, or or laxity and and looseness. Um, in men, we, they, you know, pro, they call it um, prostodynia, which is um, pelvic floor tightness or spasm of the pelvic floor muscle. Mm. And um, the men will experience recurrent, um, they say it, it's not really prostatitis, but they have symptoms uh, similar to prostatitis, so frequency, urgency, burning, dysuria, and they it feels like um, pressure, pain, and 
perhaps a urinary tract infection and they go to the urologist and they have prostate, you know, the, the guy, they feel the prostate and there's pressure in the prostate, pain in the prostate, perhaps the urologist does prostatic massage, looks at the, you know, the, the prostate fluid, maybe there's white cells, maybe there's not, but there's no, it's non-bacterial prostatitis and they get diagnosed with what's called prostatinia and that um, is associated with pelvic floor tightness or spasm of the pelvic floor muscles. And that um, that is the reason for that. I don't think that they've really identified the cause for that, mm. which is similar. There's a similar um, a similar issue that happens in in women. Women have um, tension or pelvic floor myalgia in women. In women, it's frequently associated with um, interstitial cystitis. Interstitial cystitis can also occur in men, although it's less frequent in men, but in women that have um, frequency, urgency, uh, and and pain and pelvic floor pain, it also is associated with bladder conditions. Women also have something called vulvodynia, which is pain, irritation, uh, pain and irritation in the opening of the vulva without an infection. So it's just inflammation and irritation in the um, vulva opening, in the opening of the vaginal area. Mm-hmm. And that's also associated with pelvic floor spasm. The it, traditionally, these disorders were treated with um, pelvic floor physical therapy. The cool thing now is that we have these um, new radio frequency heat, minimally invasive radio frequency heat, as well as laser light laser um, modalities to um, that are were developed for. Um, incontinence, but yet they're also helping to for pain and lichen fluorosis and resurfacing, so for um, vaginal dryness. And I don't know whether they've been used in men or not rectally. That's now that you're, now that I'm just having a stream of consciousness now, I'm thinking about that. Mm-hmm. But um, they're used a lot in women for pelvic pain, and it is the one. I mean, they, I, I can throw out some names: Votiva, Diva, Thermiva. These are um, you. You may have heard the term vaginal rejuvenation. Yes. Um, technology. So these are um, devices that function to. Um, resurface and restore vaginal mucosal health, also help to improve pelvic floor tone. They improve the collagen and elastin. They improve the vascular, neovascular, neoneural um, regeneration. So it helps to regenerate new collagen, new elastin, new nerves, how it, how it functions to, for the vulvar vestibular pain, similar to the way that Botox works. I don't know if you know that one of the treatments for, um, for vulvodynia is that, um, is Botox injections mm-hmm. and Botox, uh, Botox kills the nerves and the new nerves regenerate. With these new technologies, it doesn't kill the nerves, it just causes new nerves to, to, grow. So it's less invasive and equally, if not more effective. So for, um, for vulvar vestibular pain and pelvic floor um, spasm and pain. So I've had a lot of, lot of success for that. I don't know of anyone that's using them rectally in men, but um, you're spurring me to have a lot of, um, a lot of thoughts in that regard. So I'm gonna I'm gonna think about that. This is hopeful. I'm really glad you're you're to have you here talking about hopefulness for women because a lot of women give up easily. They're too embarrassed. They're too ashamed. Sometimes their male partners have shamed them. Um, and I've seen so much disruption in my office. So I can't wait to be able to be refer to this podcast and say there's lots of hope and lots of effectiveness. Listen to Dr. Berman talk about all this. What would you say um, are the secrets of a sexually satisfied woman? (laughs) (laughs) 
That's a good question, and um, I, and that was ta- that was the title of our book, and we you we did that with Rand, and it was based on a survey, and I would think, and I would say now, based on that, and and all the years of wisdom that I have now, that was, I wrote, we wrote that when I was in my late thirties, maybe early forties. And now I'm 55. I would say with, with hindsight and wisdom that the secrets of a sexually satisfied woman is it's all you, we, it's what, what we were doing then is trying to, um, you know, take ingredients and, and mix them together and try and, like, you know, bake a cake. And what I know now is that it's really important to take a comprehensive, holistic approach and not just about from the medical and, and emotional sort of like her relationship, her husband, her children. It's mind, body, and spirit. And the spirit, I'm going to say that again, spirit. Mm. And I'm not a healer and I'm not religious and I'm not any of that. But what I've noticed is that there that that aspect of of whatever that is spirit thing is when people are in alignment with with whatever that is the hope you know when it comes to sex when sex sexual issues crop up there is part there is um like an like it's almost like death like an aspect of you dies you know the the there's a lot of shame a lot of guilt there's you know the the relationship is you know there's there's fractures mm-hmm. there's by the time they come to me at least it's not like you know oh it just happened i have a little you know there people have been on a journey seeking you know help they they've been frustrated and um and loss of hope so and and oftentimes they've neglected it ignored it made excuses for it you know blamed it on other things and when and over time um when that happens other it becomes a snowball effect and they you know then there's this happens and that happens and then they get you know headaches and oh you know one thing leads to another so i found that other they start to neglect other things and other aspects of themselves so i um i have found that as soon as they they recognize that i have been neglecting neglecting my self, my self care, my self respect, my self love, my you know my my hope, my you know all of that stuff. Um, everything changes, and then they. I also noticed that when they are able to, and a lot of them have seen a lot of different doctors, and they go to this one for this, and then this lady said that, and this person put me on these hormones and these things, and when they are able to say, okay, I'm going to put my faith, and I'm going to believe you, that they, you, I'm going to listen to what you say and have hope that what you're saying is going to work, and, you know, here we go. And as soon as that happens, like a seed of hope is planted, and I'm going to call that faith or whatever, yep. everything everything changes. So I'm going to say mind, body, spirit, an aspect of faith and hope, that without that faith and hope in something, like when when there's just, when, when people just go to doctors and expect them, you know, put take this pill or do that or do, and yep. don't take responsibility. Like there's 60, 80% of what doctors are doing. You know, the, the patient has to participate and, you know, recognize that they play a role in everything that's happening in their body. So that's I, a I great reminder. That, that. No, it's great. Instead of being so dependent on the medical professionals and right. a pill or something outside of you that you're reminding us, uh, and for men too, and just everybody that, you know, you got to take it, 
you got to do what your own work as well. And that isn't always the case with a lot of people. What would you say, um, because we're coming to almost the end, are the vag- in terms of vaginal health, the do's and don'ts? Well, the vagina is a self-cleaning oven on its own. So don't put things in there that shouldn't be in there. Douching is bad. You know, deodorizers, perfumes, things along those lines are a no-no. Um, it, it's really designed to clean itself, you know, deodorize itself. There's, um, there's, there's not too much that, that you need to do. The thing um, I would say is there are some women that are predisposed for a number of reasons to urinary tract infections related to sexual activity and other things. Um, there's a great product that I believe is coming to market now over the counter called TheraWorks Protect for um, urinary tract health. It's an over the counter um, barrier kind of that helps prevent urinary tract infections. So I think prevention is a great thing. Um, but the um, there's not so much that we need to do to our vaginas with when in perimenopausal and menopausal women that are experiencing vaginal dryness. Speak to your healthcare. Pro- healthcare provider because those are times the pH of the vagina changes, then you're predisposed to vaginal infections, urinary tract infections, fungal infections. That's a time when estrogen is important. But um, there, there's really nothing that you need to do. If there's an oh, there, a vagina shouldn't have any odor. There, the odor that occurs is if there is an odor, you know, a strong odor, that means an infection. Mm -hmm. And other odor is just skin and sweat glands. The TheraWorks Protect, by the way, prevents skin odor. So there shouldn't be any odor. If there's a foul odor, it means that you have an infection and you need to go see your healthcare provider. Any, the, the regular odor is just from sweat glands of the skin and that's normal. A foul odor means that there's an infection. In perimenopausal, menopausal women, um, gen- develop symptoms of vaginal dryness, irritation, itchy. That um, is a result of lowering estrogen levels. That is also a time that you should speak to your healthcare provider because that, when estrogen levels are lower, you can be um, predisposed to urinary tract infections, fungal infections, and bacterial infections. So that should be at the time that that should be treated. Um, but otherwise, um, your vagina is a self-cleaning oven, like I said, and you should leave it alone. Um, wear condoms if you with with. Uh, Stay safe and, you know, carry on. Thank you so much for this. This is very, very informative. Um, how, Dr. Berman, how can people find you going forward? Are you on the Internet? And, where, and if so, how, where, can, where are you? Yeah, as Dr. Jennifer Berman, my website is bermansexualhealth.com, and you can find me on Instagram at jenbermanmd. All right. Thank you very much. I know you're busy. You've done a lot of good work and keep, I'm sure you'll keep doing it. And it was a pleasure having you on my show. Thank you very much. Likewise. Anytime. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Smart Sex, Smart Love. I'm Dr. Joe Court, and you can find me on joecourt.com. That's J-O-E-K-O-R-T.com. See you next time.